Reasonable Accommodation, Relevant Case Law Review, Political Science 398, B, Disability Rights in the Law, Dr. Peter Baxter, Law and Juris Jurisprudence Program, Spring Semester 2015. Well, I'm going to give this a try and see how long my voice lasts, but um, here we go. What I'd like to do is just go basically through the cases that I had you all read in brief um, to lay out uh, the problems confronted when the courts uh, try to apply either the Rehabilitation Act, Section 504, or the Americans with Disability Act, or the Fair Housing Act when it comes to the issue of reasonable accommodation. The first case I want to look at is the case of U.S. Airways versus Barnett, a 2002 case. Um, what was going on here, basically, is we had a baggage handler, Robert Barnett, who injured his back uh, severely during his job, his cargo handling position at U.S. Airways. Um, what Barnett did was, invoking his seniority rights, asked uh, U.S. Airways to transfer him to a less physically demanding position in the mailroom. That way he can continue to be employed um, and my, uh, have very minor impact upon his back. Um, the problem is, subsequent to his request, um, the mailroom position became subject to seniority-based employee bidding under U.S. Airways seniority system. So what happened was he moved from the baggage handler position, used his seniority to get into the mailroom, but was not senior enough in the mailroom uh, to retain his position. And as he couldn't go back to his job as a baggage handler, he lost his job. Barnett, in turn, filed suit under the Americans with Disability Act uh, for discrimination and failure to provide a reasonable accommodation. Um, the fact that he was transferred or he transferred himself to a job that was then subject subsequently to a seniority system of which he did, what did not have the senior time in and lost his position, according to Barnett, was not a reasonable accommodation. The district court finds for U.S. Airways, though. They said that altering the seniority system would cause undue hardship to not only U.S. Air, the employer, but every other person standing in line uh, under the seniority system, all the other non-disabled employees at U.S. Airways. The Court of Appeals reverses this decision and said the seniority system is merely a factor to be taken into consideration when making a reasonable accommodation under the Americans with Disability Act. So they reverse the district court finding and find for Barnett. Now, what happens? Well, the case comes before the U.S. Supreme Court on appeal. And Justice Breyer, who um, decided the case, a 5-4 opinion, um, he asked the question, does the ADA require an employer to reassign an employee <coughs> through reasonable accommodation to a position he should not hold under a seniority system? And the answer for Breyer and the mere ma majority of five was no. They said that this would violate the established seniority system and this is an unreasonable accommodation. It does not fall in with a reasonable accommodation under the purview of the Americans with Disability Act. Fascinatingly, in a dissent with Scalia and Thomas, they said the ADA requires the suspension of employment rules to make the reasonable accommodation possible. So they had a um, much more uh, pro-disability standard, which we won't see in a later case, but the argument they made was that's the least they could do is merely suspend the employment rules to make this reasonable accommodation possible. And the two other dissenters, Souter and Ginsburg, stated that U.S. Airways failed to show the undue hardship brought on by accommodating Barnett. They said that, yes, there might be individuals that might be affected, but why can't you have two promotions in the mailroom? one of Barnett and one of the most senior persons, so as to make that accommodation reasonable. The second case I want to look at is the case of Olmstead 
versus uh, LCX Rel Zimring, a 1999 case concerning the Georgia Reasonable Hospital's decision to keep two women <clears throat> in uh, psychiatric isolation. I'm a little concerned with this case. <clears throat> if um, This is their ad for their new hospital, the Georgia Reasonable Hospital. It says quality health care one life at a time, so I guess the other individuals don't get quality during their life, just one life at a time. So a little disturbing, but in any case, uh, that's a Georgia Reasonable Hospital uh, newest ad, if you will. So it's a 1999 case. The facts are that we had two mentally disabled female patients in, a psychi- in psychiatric isolation at Georgia Reasonable Ho- Regional Hospital. Now, what they did is they argued for, uh, via their attorneys, that the ADA requires the most communally integrated setting possible, that psychiatric isolation doesn't help them in their treatment. Now, the Georgia Regional Hospital countered that both individuals are truly mentally cleared, that they could go from isolation into communally integrated setting. But financial constraints um, that the hospital was um, realizing and the need to fundamentally alter the treatment program prevented these two individuals from moving. So the claim was that it would cause too much financial uh, burden and it would require the hospital to fundamentally alter treatment programs for the two. And as we all know, it's quality health care, one life at a time. Apparently not these two women. The question before the court was, should financial constraints determine whether states need to comply with the ADA? Because here is the thin edge of the wedge, if you will. If states could claim non-compliance because of financial constraint, then the ADA would have no teeth whatsoever. So that was the question before the court. And the court said, no, financial constraints cannot be a determinant in whether the state will be required to comply with um, the Americans with Disability Act. Now, the interesting thing is the court said, even though both patients were placed in communal settings while this case was pending, the issue was still ripe, meaning the issue of financial constraint as a non-compliance tool against the ADA was still a question. So even though the two individuals were subsequently moved from psychiatric isolation to a communally integrated setting, did not eliminate the issue before the court. And the issue before the court was could financial constraints determine whether a state need to comply with the ADA. Also, they argued that financial constraints may be significant and on the financial constraint issue the court decided to remand the case meaning send it back down for a more thorough analysis of the Georgia Regional Hospital spending priorities so they wanted to look into what this hospital was actually paying for um, if they couldn't shift two patients from isolation to an integrated communal setting. The next case I would like to look at with you is um, Nelson versus Miller, again, a 1999 case. And it really is disturbing in this day and age that we have a case like this and uh, actually the case that was able to follow. The facts are these. Blind voters in Michigan claim that the Michigan Constitution and the Americans with Disability Act requires that they not be excluded from a secret voting program. The Michigan Constitution um, assures Michigonians, or whatever you call them, um, that they would uh, could avail themselves always of secret voting. And the question was before the court uh, whether the Michigan Constitution and ADA requires a reasonable accommodation to assure that blind voters could vote secretly. Now, the claim by the blind voters is that reasonable accommodations could be secured to make this happen. 
to assure that uh, voting would be secret for those who are blind. The court's holding uh, in this case was Michigan's constitutional assurance of secret voting was not in fact violated since a program did not prohibit personal voter assistance for the blind. So while the blind voters were correct that they should have the greatest amount of secret voting possible, it did not prohibit voting assistance for the blind, an individual to go in with them to help them, um, and that was good enough. In fact, the court also looked at the fact that uh, children often accompany their parents in the voting booth, and uh, we uphold this as a very positive civic lesson for the young. The argument being, well, what happens to the Michigan constitutional <coughs> assurance of secret voting if not only the voter but his or her children are also in the ballot box with them? The court stated that though the blind voters were not required to prove um, that there were reasonable accommodations because uh, Michigan, in kind of a sour note, turned um, against the blind in their uh, rebuttal and argued that, well, okay, blind voters, if you want the Assurance of Seeker Voting Program, then how do we make this possible, right? So they turned on the blind voters to prove that there were reasonable accommodations that could and would give them equal access and ballot secrecy. Well, the court stated that the blind voters are not required uh, to prove the state's case uh, that there are or there are not reasonable accommodations. Now the next case is probably the most um, disturbing for me because it doesn't come out of a financially strapped area of the country. It comes out of a federal territory, that being the District of Columbia. And if you look there's a picture of the Metro down below, Judiciary Square, N- jury duty, know your rights, uh, good jurors nullify bad laws, you know. Um, so, you know, since this case, uh, there's been a really strong push. But let's look at this 1993 case with the, with the idea that justice is, in fact, blind. Okay. According to the facts... The District of Columbia has had, has had on its books the summary exclusion of blind persons from serving on juries. If you were blind and you were called to jury duty and you showed up, you were excused automatically because of your blindness. And that's in the Federal District of Columbia. A little bit disturbing. DC argues that visual observation is an essential function of one juror's duties. Thus, they stated that a juror must have sight to be an effective juror. Now, the fascinating thing is D.C. uh, in uh, lead-up papers and the like pointed out that they had not consulted any literature on whether a blind juror could function, quote-unquote, normally. They merely assumed a stereotype. And based on this stereotype, issued this severe exclusionary rule against blind persons serving on jurors. Galloway brings suit under Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. And it goes up to the district court. The district court uh, holds the following. It disapproves of D.C. stereotype. In very clear language, they were highly uh, disapproving of DC stereotype as a rationale for excluding blind jurors. The next minute, DC can come up with a stereotype against women, against blacks, against the aged. And thus, uh, these stereotypes are not a basis for a rationale for excluding jurors and for uh, jury duty. The district court, in turn, argues that they favor a case by case assessment. They would look, they would, <laughs> ironically, They would look at the blind juror given the evidence that would be presented at trial. So in some trials, perhaps they could be excluded (coughs) if there was a lot of visual evidence. But if there isn't, and most of the evidence comes through testimony, uh, blind jurors, as adequate, if not more adequate, 
uh, to serve as a juror because their attention. Well, there's a stereotype. Uh, <laughs> but you understand. Well, no, I won't go on because I, I'll sound stereotypical. Um, any case, a case-by-case -case assessment in the light of the evidence presented at the trial would be to determine whether a specific juror could or should be excluded. One important thing the district court points out and underscores is when you're talking about barring jurors from serving on a jury, you're impinging upon fundamental constitutional rights. You cannot deny individuals all mass according to some fa fascist, oh no, not fascist, facile stereotype. Um, because uh, you start doing that. You're taking away a basic, fundamental, constitutional, and civic right of uh, a U.S. citizen. Now, some of you might know this case, uh, PGA Tour versus Martin. This is Mr. Martin, Casey Martin, a golfer. Um, was quite a good golfer. Made it to Augusta and many of the other major um, golfing events. And this is what he needed. He needed a golf cart. According to the facts, Casey Martin has a degenerative circulatory disorder in his legs. Well, throughout his body, but especially in his legs. And it prevents him from walking golf courses. Obviously, walking the golf course, according to the PGA, is an essential part of the golf match. That without the walking, you're not playing golf. Um, Casey Martin makes a request to the PGA to use a golf cart in a major tournament, and the PGA outright refuses, saying that you're not playing golf then. You're playing some other sport. It's not golf, and it's not sanctioned by the PGA. Martin then files suit under Title III of the Americans with Disability Act for any entity operating public accommodations. He makes the argument that the PGA Tour itself is a public accommodation. And that the PGA, like any other organization, needs to make reasonable accommodations. In this case, he said reasonable modifications, i.e. the golf cart. The district court entered an injunction on the PGA requiring it to allow Martin to use a cart. <coughs> the district court thus dictated to the PGA that uh, Martin must be allowed to use a cart. The court said that walking the course is um, to insert fatigue, and they agreed with the PGA. Walking the course does insert a certain form of fatigue, making the latter holes harder because you're tired. You're more tired than you were on the first hole than you are on the 18th hole. Um, but in a kind of a quirky way, the district court said that well, we don't have to worry about fatigue because Martin is already fatigued from his circulatory disorder. So um, Casey Martin is realizing the same, if not more, fatigue during his golf game. The Court of Appeals merely affirmed. It said that the course, the PGA Tour, is a public accommodation and that the use of the card will not fundamentally change the nature of the game. So they totally agreed, hands down, with the district court. Well, it goes to the Supreme Court. And in a 7-2 to decision, penned by Justice John Paul Stevens, um, he agrees with the district court's initial assumption that the walking rule that the PGA requires to create fatigue is adequately substituted by Martin's own circulatory disorder. Martin's own condition. Oh, now, here's the strange thing. Scalia and Thomas, this time, when it becomes country clubs, I'm being very um, bitter here, probably, they dissented. Uh, they were the two dissenters in this case, siding instead with the PGA. So, um, you know, on one hand, they're very pro ADA. On the other hand, then they withdraw it when it has to do with private clubs, I guess, since... So much of the PGA Tour is subject to so many private club on the tour. Now, 
What I want to uh, discuss with you now is the case of United States versus Rose and Sons. Now, the gentleman on the left, you'll see, he's actually the location manager for the construction firm Rose and Sons, and he doesn't look happy there either, does he? Well, what was happening? Well, this is a Fair Housing Act case because the feds came in under the Fair Housing Act and halted construction on 14 apartment complexes since the disabled person would not be able to enter their apartments through the common area. Unlike the apartment you see to the lower right, um, these apartments are set up in such a way as the common area then went upstairs to each person's apartment front door. And thus the common area to the front door was not accessible with persons with disabilities. The construction company argued that the disabled person could still enter their apartment. All they would have to do is go around the back of their house from the common area and enter through a back patio. So they did have access to their apartment, uh, merely not from the common area. The Fair Housing Act clearly stated that all dwellings built after March 13th, I don't know why March 13th, 1991, be readily accessible and usable by handicapped persons. So obviously it doesn't retrofit earlier buildings, but any building since 1991 needed to be readily accessible and usable by handicapped persons. You notice the date of the case is 2004. Clearly we're, we're within the coverage of the Fair Housing Act mandate. Now, the court here finds that there's irreparable harm to those with disability. And since the Fair Housing Act provides for injunctive relief, uh, these and further apartments that Rose and Sons sought to build it was in about three or four different states, 14 different apartment complexes. So it wasn't just a minor uh, situation. All of the current and future apartments must further uh, must provide common area entrance to persons with disabilities. Something like the apartment you see on the right. Now, obviously that would pertain to the ground floor because I'm not sure if that's a single apartment or a series of apartments. If it is, then it needs a, a lift of some sort. Now, what happened is the FHA and the court came in very strongly that it's irreparable harm to people with disabilities if they could not, like other apartment dwellers, access their apartment in a normal way from a common area. Instead of having to shuttle around to the back of their apartment and through a patio door into, God only knows, the living room, uh, kitchen, or the like. They also added the court, and it was kind of a, a weary note, not a weary note, a wary note, you know, a clear note, that such construction also adds barriers, and such barriers would add to housing discrimination against the disabled. So it's not a minor issue that an apartment dweller with a disability, a physical disability, should be able to enter their apartment, their flat, from the common area like every other person. The court orders that all construction activity in these 14 complexes be halted until accessibility requirements are addressed and we can bring it back to the requirement, the mandate of 1991 by the Fair Housing Act. The final case I want to look at is kind of bringing it home. At least it brings it home to Rochester. Because the case is a very crazy one called United States versus Freer. And anybody who knows Canadian comedy understands that the three gentlemen at the lower right are trailer park boys. Um, because it has to do with the trailer park. Facts are these. The landlord in a mobile home park refused to allow a disabled person in a wheelchair to construct a ramp to her trailer door. She could wheel up to her trailer, but she wouldn't be able to get into it uh, because of stairs. What she requested was that she'd be able, she be able 
to construct a ramp to her trailer door. The landlord argued that the ramp would impede trailer removal so that once the trailer was going to be removed, they would have the further complication of removing the ramp. And it also indirectly obstructed the trailer park's access road. And we know how important those trailer park access roads are, well, according to the landlord. The plaintiff argued that the denial denied her the use and enjoyment of her home. In other words, she could wheel up to her home, enjoy the look of it, but had a very rough time getting into it to use it and enjoy it. And embarrassing, you know. She had to be lifted up the stairs and her wheelchair lifted up the stairs um, each time, which is uh, demeaning and embarrassing to a person in a wheelchair. The court in Rochester, New York, stated that the landlord failed to rebut the presumption of discrimination. In other words, the court saw this case for what it was, discriminatory against a person with a physical disability, um, a wheelchair. So the landlord, the court argued, failed to rebut the presumption of discrimination. Putting it in the positive, or the positive negative, the, the landlord, in fact, was discriminatory. The landlord also failed to show any undue financial or administration burden, like impeding the trailer removal or obstructing the park's access road. Um, the landlord of the trailer park failed to show any undue financial or administrative burden. Uh, he tried, um, and we know that this is an out for companies, corporations, and the like, but it wasn't proven here. The court then orders an injunction, uh, a positive mandatory injunction, permitting the plaintiff to install her wheelchair ramp. And now she could not only wheel up to her house, she could wheel right into it and enjoy it like every other homeowner. Well, um, you know what this means. Uh, I hope you bared up through my very scratchy uh, voice and was able to glean uh, some great information uh, about these cases on reasonable accommodation. Um, quite a mixed bag, but um, I hope you found them fascinating.